Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. He's an interesting guy. I know you think that. I know you think you think that. Oh, I do think that. But then you see the one with uh, John I, Lithgow. That's, I, we'll skip that one. No, you're going to say that that's <laughs> triumphant I will auteur never say that. cinema. And that's, I will never say that. You and I both know that's totally bogus, no matter how often you say it. And uh, it, um, it, no, it's terrible. It's it, tor it torpedoes the catalog. That's the problem. That's it is we're a not lead do... <laughs> weight. 
What is? I don't even know what it is. Splint the uh, split personality. No split. Uh, raising raising cane. cane. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Terrible. We've dis- we've discussed how bad that is on the show before. I don't think it can be discussed too much. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you what I have done? Uh, I wanted to. I I had a couple of uh, ketchups. First of all, I saw. You know what I saw today, which I totally missed in the whirlwind of vacation. Uh, I saw uh, Pacific Rim. <laughs> hey, wow! Welcome to uh, right? welcome to the summer. <laughs> Live in the now. That's right. Uh, you know what? I uh, I had a good time at that movie. Okay. I, I felt like, you know what, can I tell you what I felt like? There's a brief review. I have two movies with brief reviews. Reviews. Mm-hmm. Pacific Rim was a story that, or was a movie that told the story of a part of the timeline that I think should have been a sequel. Okay. And seen. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? Like there was there was a lot of exposition in the beginning, like a ton uh-huh. of exposition, and I don't think it really helps because the most interesting stuff I was most interested in was the the discovery and the building of these things, and they just kind of and action, and I you know I felt like there was a lot of I, I could have used a more gentle entree into the universe. So yeah, but uh, it was really fun for what it was. I had a a great time watching giant robot boxing robot monster boxing and uh i kind of felt bad for the monsters they just yeah they well they i loved the look of the monsters. oh yeah no very you know that's what it it was like just enough pan's labyrinth (laughs) and i was okay with it just (laughs) enough guillermo that's it definitely was it definitely was yeah you know i had fun with it but i I thought, uh, what's his name? Charlie Hunnam was completely forgettable. Shouldn't have been in there. Yeah. No, and no, no, no. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it's fun, but uh, nothing to write home about for me. Yes. All right. Uh, and so we'll move on to Oblivion. Believe it or not, I hadn't seen that one either. Wow, you are catching up on things. I totally caught up. And I quite liked it. It made me want to go see Moon again. Oh, that's right. You don't have any other points? Talk about a movie that has uh, exposition in it. Man, wow. Two, <laughs> two ten-minute doses of exposition. <laughs> one in the beginning, one in the middle. Somehow I think it kind of works. Like I, had a, I, I really enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed I, it. I didn't have really too many problems with it. I thought it was a fun movie. Yeah, no, it was good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's it. What do, you, do you have any follow-up? Well, I uh, I saw some fun. I don't know if "fun" is the right word, but some some good little indie films. Uh, you know, I uh, some friends and I we went and saw "Still Mine," which is the new film that's slowly being released across the country. Uh, I it kind of went all indie, you know, art house sort of uh, this week. It's a, uh, a, a if you're if you saw a more and you need more stories about old people romance. Go see Still Mine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it's, uh, but the, the, I don't know if that sells it really well, but. <laughs> God, we, that's a series. Old people romance movie. That's right. <laughs> but James Cromwell is in it. He's the lead. And uh, Genevieve Bujold is his wife. And they're great. I mean, it, great screen, screen chemistry. I really enjoyed them. And it's, I guess it's based on a true story about this this old guy who really wanted to kind of stick it to, uh, he, well, he wasn't really setting out to stick it to the uh, the government. He was trying to build a house on his own property. And they started coming after him for not you know, not having his wood inspected and not this and that. And he's trying to build his house uh, so that it's ready by the time his wife gets out of the hospital and just going through all the, the rigmarole of battling with the, the uh, government as far as all of the paperwork. Mm-hmm. I, it, it, there was a lot of applause in the theater because people were just so pissed off at, uh, you know, the way this government guy was reacting and, and seeing James Cromwell stick it to him was, uh, was pretty great. So we saw that, and then we saw a nice little uh, foreign film called A Hijacking, which is another film about Somali pirates <laughs> hijacking a boat, in this case, a Danish boat. You go, uh, a cinematic double dipper. 
I tell you, I know seeing that, and then uh, you know, it got me all amped up for seeing the uh, Captain the Hanks. Paul Greengrass uh, Tom Hanks movie. Yeah, so <laughs> they did not have the giant hoses on the side of their little boat. Oh, the fire hoses. Yeah, the giant hoses. Well, that, that probably that, made that probably made the up. difference. <laughs> probably, <laughs> they had a little a little fishing vessel compared to Tom Hanks's boat. So, well, you know, budgets. That's right. That's right. But you know, but two good films. I really enjoyed them. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. So put them on the list. What are we? Uh, what is your? You know what I feel like we need? We need some bumper music, like transition music. We need some stingers. Yeah. How was that? That was perfect. Do it one more time. And now for our trailer segment, Andy. What do you have for your trailer this evening? This is a real winner. This trailer is just. It's. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. It's called Bad Milo. <laughs> and it's an exclamation point on the end. So bad, Milo. <laughs> and you should know that the trailer we posted uh, on the website at thenextreel.com is the red band trailer for Bad Milo. Yes. yes, it is the red band. You can see the non-red band over on the iTunes movie trailer page, but uh, the red band is up on our page. Embrace your inner demon is the tagline for this film. This film from, is, uh, <laughs> from the colon up. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, I went there. You, you I did. did. It looks like it's uh, produced by the the Duplass brothers, who are kind of have been storming the indie scene in the last uh, uh, the last I don't know few years or so. They've been Mark and Jay Duplass have been kind of everywhere it seems in all the indie circles. This film is a horror comedy about a guy who learns that you know, he's having these awful digestive problems, and he learns that these problems are caused by a demon living in his intestines. And this demon starts coming out and and getting back at the people who torment him, and it just looks, it looks like a wacky, crazy version. Like this monster almost looks like ET in some freaky way. It's just the weirdest looking movie, and it just had me laughing. And I I'm quite looking forward to it. Uh, Patrick Warburton is in it. Peter Stormare, uh, Stephen Root. And uh, Ken Marino is the is the lead. It's it's like Office Space if there were a demon. The, yes, it's 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 in that, that vein. Yeah, it's and and the fact that Stephen Root is in it makes it so much better. Yeah, it's like some backwoods hippie or something. Oh, uh, it's it, it looks. I was I was um, I was skeptical about this one. Not like last <laughs> week's Ega. I was skeptical about this one, and you you came through. I think it looks, I think it looks funny. I'm looking forward to it. It does. It it's yeah. uh it's you can start streaming it August 29th on iTunes, and it's going to open theaters October 4th. Oh, love that. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, okay. So mine, uh, I'm really really excited about this. I remember when I was uh when I, I don't know when do you read that? When did you read this short story? Never. You've never read what? I never. I don't think I ever have. It's wicked short. Hey, eh? it's very easy. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, I did. I, I honestly don't remember. All right, I so didn't even remember it was based on a short story. So. The uh, short story by James Thurber um, is it's fantastic about this car- The the the, the um, story, uh, the secret life of Walter Mitty, is a fantastic story about this this man who has these sort of alternate fantasies. Uh, a fantasy worlds in his head, and so whatever context he sort of enters, he's he's suddenly in this uh, alternate universe. And um, I remember when I was in, I, I think I must have been in, uh, like, I don't know, eighth, ninth grade when we read it, and I came in and I read it to my dad, who was sitting on the couch, you know, and it was, <laughs> he had his arm back over the couch, and he was, I don't know, he was kind of mad at something, I don't know. So I read this story, I wasn't really paying attention to, you know, context, and uh, and I'll never forget. He looks over at me and he says, mm, "Life, that's pretty much it." <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Wisdom from Pete's dad. <laughs> that's awesome. That so is awesome. Uh, in 1947, they they made this uh, thing a movie, and it was it, it wasn't filled with that that sort of uh, malaise that I think you you get when you're uh, you know sort of a middle-aged man kind of dealing with that uh, <laughs> that piece of life. And, and uh, it was a Danny Kaye kind of a, with lots of singing. Yeah. 
and pleasantries and funny, and uh, it, it just didn't really satisfy on the level of, of communicating what the short story was. And so that is why I am so excited to post on the blog uh, my trailer of the week, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, coming out on Christmas Day, December 25th, 2013, directed by and starring Ben Stiller as Walter Mitty. And it the trailer is beautiful. Yeah. It, it really is, is it is really stunning what they have what they appear to have done taking this man and um and making him the hero uh of his own mind and i find it uh i find it really i've watched it a number of times that and i think it's just um uh, it's it's really mesmerizing and I guess there's a couple of versions of the trailer yeah that's what i heard didn't uh, steve had written and what did he say that the the one he saw um, was uh, there was something about the car at the end? It was the blue Ended car with, versus yeah. the red car. Right, you've got the two cars, yeah. the blue or red. And I can't remember what the other version that he said was. Yeah, yeah, and so that was. I, I think that was the only difference that he said. There was a funny tweak at the end there, but um, the uh, the other. Let's see, what else has he? Uh, this is a, a movie that's written by Steve Conrad. Um, uh, who has done, uh, he did The Pursuit of Happiness uh, with Will Smith and mm. Son. Uh, he also did The Weatherman with Nicolas Cage and uh, wrestling Ernest Hemingway. Um, mm. You know, that was uh, with uh, Richard Harris and Shirley MacLaine and Robert Duvall. I loved that movie. Right? And so he's, he, I, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to this movie. I feel like it's... Uh, it's got a good pedigree, and I I'm a big fan of Ben Stiller. I think he's great. So, yeah, he's. Uh, when has he directed last? I mean, I don't. It's kind of few and far between, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, let's see. His last um, looks he, like his, uh, Tropic Thunder, uh, which was boldly funny. Yeah, I really enjoy Tropic Thunder. Um, let's see. And then the Zoolander. Station, Zoolander. Uh, yeah. Some TV movies like and The then, Station. The yeah, cable he, guy, cable and the guy, cable, that's Zoolander, the one. Tropic Thunder. Yeah, that's and the reality bites. Yeah. Yep. So you know, I, I, I think I may be alone. Did you like Zoolander? I loved Zoolander. I, I, I really did not love it. I, in any it way. is funnier every time I see it. Let's do quotes yeah. from it. Just you I watched and me. it once, and I'll tell you the one quote that I do say from it because I did find it funny what? was. Uh, I've got the black lung pop. <laughs> Other than that, I didn't like the movie at all. <laughs> <laughs> They're breakdance fighting. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Derek. I'm a coal miner, not a professional film or television actor. <laughs> uh, I, it's... I know this could go on all night. I know. Moisture is the essence of wetness, and wetness is the essence of beauty. <laughs> oh, and scene. Uh, Good I don't, job. I, I resent that. I resent that cut. <laughs> it's a walk-off. Oh, the man. fact that Billy Zane is even in that movie makes me just uh, giddy. ba da ba ba bow And now Billy for our Zane feature of, film... Uh, no, that was my oh. that was my stinger, oh. <laughs> and I think it was actually the I'm loving it. Uh, <laughs> I know. Was... <laughs> no, I was I was trying to do a stinger. Yeah, We're gonna be yeah. <laughs> Oh, <shh. laughs> curse you! Let's talk about this movie tonight. I'm really excited about this. We're doing. Uh, we're continuing our in our <laughs> never-ending series of couples on the run. Tonight it's kids on the run, a special subgenre of the couples on the run <laughs> parent genre. Uh, this is uh, uh, Night of the Hunter, and this is one I had not seen. Uh, That's right. And you uh, say that it is one of your all-time favorites. I I do well. I don't know if that's exactly what I said. I think but you said all-time ever favorites. <laughs> I will die for this film. I <laughs> I don't I don't think it was quite there, but I do really really enjoy this film, and it's a film that I I, I don't know I kind of take differently every time I see it. You know, the funny thing is, this is a film I saw back in college in my film noir class. The more I watch it, 
the less I feel there's much film noir in it, it certainly kind of has yeah. the noirish look to it. It has like the 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 light and the shadow and everything. And the title. Over- yeah, well, and the title, <laughs> and Robert Mitchum, and Robert there Mitchum. Are, there definitely <laughs> right. are things going for it that yeah. put it into that that genre. But when you watch it, it really isn't a, a noir. Um, and uh, so yeah. I don't know. I find it less and less noir the more I watch it. But the more I watch it, the more I really love it, and just find this connection to something about the. Uh, the fairy tale aspect of it, and uh, it's it's a film that I I don't know I I feel is almost like it's almost like a like this delicate little film, and I I it's almost like an eggshell, one of those you know ornate Russian eggshells, and I always feel like I need to be very delicate with it because there's something about it that I just feel um, Charles Lawton was going for something very specific with this film, and I think he created kind of an almost anomaly of a film back in 1955 that obviously didn't uh, it didn't do very well and i don't think people knew what to make of it at the time i think as time has grown uh, gone on i think more people have uh, found an affinity for it and have connected to it and um i'm one of those people and i've i really have kind of connected to this film i enjoy it uh i'm I can't wait for my children to get old enough where i feel like i can actually show it to them and probably scare the bejesus out of them but <laughs> It's, but I feel like it's this delicate film because Charles Lawton was going for something so different and people didn't get it. And it's like I, I feel almost a little protective of it. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. that I, I really like the way you talk about it, right? I, I think that's um, – I, I think you're right. And I, I have a feeling that's how the film is going to age for me. Um, uh, so there, there are an awful lot of layers uh, to this film. And – uh, so many things that that really jump out at me as as interesting to talk about. The, it is, uh, first of all, it is really uh, beautiful. It's a beautiful sort of stage play on screen. The sets are are interesting. The uh, and and like you say, it's just sort of fragile. Everything looks like it's held together very delicately. And and uh, you you just kind of get a sense that you're in the universe until Lawton does this this neat trick where he pulls back and does this super wide scene. And several times he does it, looking over across the farmland and the bike going across farmland. He pulls back and does this sort of cross section of the house, uh, it, you know, where you'll you'll see the characters going downstairs into the cellar, you know, but you see kind of the whole side of the house as if it's been right. cut open. And it gives you this sense that everything is just sort of, uh, you're you're able to pick apart, not just the, the, uh, the nuance of of each role in the film which i I think is fascinating but but even the the physical layer of the film that that you can you can move it around and look at it from so many different angles uh that that i think is just really wonderful another scene that really stuck out a sequence that stuck sticks out for me and i'm sure we'll talk about this in more detail later is uh, as the um as the kids get away uh, and and I'm going to let you do a, a debrief of the or the synopsis of the plot here in, in just a mm-hmm. second. But as the kids get away, they make it to the river and they they head down the river and we get this sort of respite from the chase. Uh, and we we get it from the perspective not necessarily of the kids or uh, you know or or Powell uh, the crazy preacher, uh, but from bugs and woodland creatures. And mm-hmm. it is. It is such a, it's kind of a sweetly jarring uh, sequence right in the middle of this otherwise really darkly scary uh, chase that I found myself really attracted to it. Yeah, it's it's almost like strangely the nature in the film is kind of watching over these children and guiding them safely down the river right, or something. Right, yeah. right, right. That's that's the sense you get. And and. Well, let's let's do. Would you do uh, just do a little synopsis of the storyline? It's a, a fairly simple story, and just get us started. Sure, uh, we meet Robert Mitchum's character, uh, Harry Powell, I believe is his name, who is a, uh, a he's put in prison for stealing a car, but he also talks to the quote unquote Lord about these women that he kills. He he kills women. Um, like widows and steals their money and makes off. And so he's in jail. He hears about this, uh, this, his cellmate has stolen $10,000 and this, it takes place in, you know, 
post depression, but kind of that early thirties. And he hears him talking about how this ten thousand dollars that he stole and he hid, and he uh, the this guy gets executed. The preacher is released, and he goes after the widow of this uh, this man who's in prison, and uh, basically marries her under the guise of I was a former prison preacher. Um, he the kids are kind of on to him, particularly the son, and can tell that he's after the money. And eventually, basically, the preacher kills the wife. The kids go on the run uh, because the money is hidden in the little girl's doll. And then they are rescued by this woman who lives on the river, kind of taking in orphans. And she basically helps them, you know, through the you know escape from this guy who's pursuing them. I guess that's kind of a long, the long and the short of it. Yeah, the I I think that's uh, both long and short. <laughs> uh, I I want to talk about the 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 I, I think the kids first, yeah. Uh, because so much. I mean, the way you set it up for me was that this was a couples on the run from the perspective of the kids. I mean, it is, but that's that's the way it's. It sounds like that's the way you remember the film when you talk about it to others. I think that's well. It, it it's a couples on the run film. It's it's these two kids who do have to go on the run. Now they're only running for. Uh, it's about two thirds of the way into the film where they actually go on the run. And they have to escape the preacher who's now pursuing them because he wants the money. Um, but it really is a story about them just dealing with this. And really the story is the boy's story. It is told from essentially from his point of view, although one could argue it's kind of told from Lillian Gish's character's point of view since she does open the film. She uh, with these kind of, you know, these stories that she tells to the kids from the Bible and it ends with her as well. But I think the large part of it is from the son's uh, point of view. The son being uh, Billy, or sorry, John, John Harper, Harper, played by Billy Billy Chapin, and uh, and his sister Pearl Harper, uh, played by Sally Sally Jane Bruce. And I think they were like ten and five at the time that uh, that they made this film. And Billy Chapin really has to carry the the bulk of the film on his shoulders because it really is from his perspective. And I think that's looking at the film from a kind of a kid's perspective as this, I mean, I think Charles Lawton described it as a uh, nightmarish mother goose tale. Uh, I think that fits. And so when you see it as kind of a kid's story and it's from the kid's perspective, it really kind of, to me, it makes more and more sense the more I watch it that this really is the boy's film. And this is kind of his vision of everything that's going on. And, and even some of the way that some of the sets are, built and made it almost films feels like a kid's perspective of this is how the world is like the basement which feels very tiny for a basement but from a kid's perspective you've got this giant looming man over you in this little confined space i i i, I think that it works really well from from that look i i you know i do too and i think i i just want to add just because it just jumped out at me he was uh, that billy chapin you know the movie came out in 1955 he was born in 1943. Okay, so and, he's But when you look at his his first acting performance was in 1944, Casanova <laughs> Brown, uh, and he was in uh, 12 or 13 other uh, shows or films before he did Night of the Hunter in 55. <laughs> yeah, he was a very, very busy child actor, and he actually retired from acting a few years in, after this. In 59, yeah. I think I it. think what I heard is he kind of hit that point where he was in those early teen years and really couldn't quite, uh, you know, just, it, it was those awkward years and he couldn't get the roles, and he, and I think, ended up getting, you know, having some drug or alcohol problems and, right. and, and quit the business. And uh, from what I what I've read is he's, you know, fine. He's retired and he's still living in Southern California doing something. I don't know. You know, it's his performance, I think is the, it, it, to me, it's a keystone performance, right? Because, uh, this kid is betrayed every which way from Sunday, right? Yeah. Everyone in the film on some level betrays him until he meets, uh, Ms. Rachel, uh, Ms. Rachel. Yeah. Uh, and it is even, you know, when you watch each of these successive betrayals, first his father betrays him by, you know, dying in front of him. 
mm-hmm. uh, or getting arrested. Or getting arrested. Yeah. He get, he watches his father get arrested, and then he uh, uh, and then he's you know he and his sister make that promise. They they swear that they're never going to reveal the secret of where the money is, and uh, and and uh, his mother loses it and, and and betrays him, and the preacher who comes to him and and is a. Um, you know, is a, a comes to him in the form of a savior figure, and mm-hmm. turns out to be a dark sort of nemesis figure. Uh, yeah. And and the uncle who who says, "Anytime you need me, you come to me." And when when he desperately needs help, the uncle had already betrayed him to the bottle and and was yeah. drunk and passed out. Like it's just one after another of watching this kid get just kicked, uh, you know, every which way. Uh, and finally, he is his, uh, you know, the last one when his sister betrays him. Uh, mm-hmm. And and you realize that the sister has been, you know, she's only five and she doesn't yeah. know any better, but he expects so much more of her. Uh, his, you know, the way he plays each of those betrayals, I think in, in a, f- a film of this nature, of this period, is really sophisticated and, and it's a real pleasure to watch. And I have to imagine, like when you say he's, you know, he's fine, he's retired. I, is he really fine after this? <laughs> he chased, I, chased by a demon preacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding, no kidding. But and, and speaking to that, I think you're right in in how um, how he sees everything and how he grows to understand things. Because even though his sister does betray him, it's him who finally catches on to that. And and when the preacher is getting close to getting the sister to reveal, he says, "I'll tell you where it is." And the preacher's like, "You know, didn't I tell you to shut up?" And he's like, right. "Pearl, Pearl swore you. I, I don't want to make her tell. I'll tell you." And just that like level of maturity, where you know what she's she's only five. She swore. I don't want her to have to break her promise. I will break my promise, and I'll tell you. He's he's all of a sudden kind of becoming the man that he has to become. And then when he uh, when uh, Uncle Bertie is passed out drunk, and 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 John stands up and he says, "There's always the river." You can see that he's kind of there's been a little bit of a transformation there in him, and he's kind of stepped up to this point where I'm now going to have to be the one in charge of this family. And there's a little bit of that growth in there, and I I really enjoy that performance from Billy Chapin in this. Well, I do too, and and forgive me, I don't have the the script open, but the the line at the end, it's um, Miss Rachel's uh, line at the end when talking about the uh, as she's like looking off into the into the somber middle distance, and she talks about you know what the kids. Yeah, she are, says they uh, they abide and they endure. Yeah, I mean it's just a, yeah. it it makes it a very powerful sort of statement. Uh, and and bookend to his performance and what he has been, uh, what what you know, little John has been able to do over the course of this film. Yeah. Um, and and watch not just the people that he loves betray him, but his symbols betray him too. Once the the church has betrayed him in the form of this of this uh, Harry Powell. Well, and then even his own emotions end up betraying him to a certain extent, and that's something I really love about the end of this film how the parallels between the torture and the torment of this young boy seeing his father uh, get arrested and and he's been holding this secret and keeping it and he's been fighting all the way down the river into Miss Rachel's arms and everything only to see the preacher get arrested who is a horrible person and rightly should get put away and then when he sees him getting arrested, he breaks down again because it's it's all it's come full circle, and he's back to that emotional state that he was with with his father, and he's just like he's just screaming and he's he's pounding the doll on his chest, saying, "Take it! I don't want it anymore! I don't want it! I can't do it!" It's like you finally get that breakdown from him that you've needed, and then he's not even able to testify against him because he's finally kind of gone out of that. I need to be a grown up mode, and it's almost like he's reverted back to the kid that he needs to be. Is that that's your sense of it? I I I think I may have had a different take on it that that it wasn't so much that um, that he's reverted to a kid, but that he's come to a new sense of awareness and, and maturity. Here I am, like armchair screenwriting. Uh, <laughs> but but there is I I got this sense particularly um, you know at the um, you know at the close of the. The sequence where uh, the court sequence when he just mm-hmm. wouldn't look at at him. Yeah, he just wouldn't look over there and acknowledge that he was the that that Powell was the 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 you know uh, assailant. Yeah, was that he was uh, he had reached that point of exhaustion and the maturity to move on. Hmm. Okay. 
uh, and I, I sort of prefer it that way. I prefer watching him actually grow up. I feel like that's the that's the journey that he needed to go on for me as a viewer. I needed to see him accomplish this. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like that final sequence of gifts at the end uh, in back in Miss Rachel's house uh, cemented that for me. Sure. I, I can see it that way. I think I could buy that. I, I don't know. I guess I've always just seen it because it comes right after the scene where he, you know, he breaks down yeah. and he, you know, it's that. And then it's, I don't know, it just, there's that, that nature of a a child just unable to acknowledge something. I, I guess that's how I always took it, but I can see it your way too. I, I could actually, I'll have to watch it again and, and think about that. Yeah, you know, I it's it. Yeah, I I I do too. Obviously, having only seen it once, I'm, that's just my initial take. But uh, mm-hmm. but but again, it was the same thing that that I we've talked about in a number of our film noir films, uh, acknowledging that this is not necessarily a film noir. Um, that I you know I as a viewer, I tend to be the one to need to see that sense of growth and accomplishment, and sometimes that's what leaves me profoundly let down. And so I'm always biased towards seeing that, um, uh, to, towards seeing it end in a more positive mm-hmm. kind of note. Yeah. Uh, I need this kid not to be catatonic. <laughs> well, uh, I don't think he's catatonic. I just think it's, <laughs> I just think it's one of those, one of those moments where it's just, it's a painful part of his life uh, that yeah. he just, he can't go back to that place because right. it took him to such a horrible, nightmarish, you know, journey. And, it, you know, he needs to be in a place where he can kind of let go of that for a while. Absolutely. All right. I buy that. Let's, uh, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about uh, the Reverend. Can we? Good old Mitchum, Robert Mitchum. Uh, he, he's, he, he really is pretty terrifying in this. But the thing that I think is really interesting is that Charles Lawton, and I haven't read the book that this is based on, um, the book by oh, is it Davis Grubb? Grubb? Davis Grubb. Yeah, I haven't read the book. Um, I guess it's really. Uh, I actually it had been really hard to to find. I you believe can that find it now. They it's finally, yeah, the, in two thousand five, yeah. they just uh, just uh, republished it. So I I want to pick it up. Yeah, we've got a link but, to it on the website. Yeah, but the um, uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, you know how the Reverend was written. If he kind of went from this evil to kind of this almost kind of comedic monster type of thing. I don't know how it was in the novel, but I really like that Charles Lawton did that. And I've always fluctuated with that. And I I guess I should say, I really like that on this viewing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> because I, there are some times where I watch this and I'm like, it is just so absurd how Robert Mitchum acts sometimes in this film. Um, as much as I like his performance and as, as, as horrible, horrible as, of a person as I feel his character is in this film. But there are moments where it's like this over the top kind of just crazy monster. And when you put it in the perspective of I, this is all kind of a, a children's fable and it you know a lot of those kind of Grimm's fairy tales and things like that had kind of this darkness mixed with the 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 kind of lightness and the comedic sort of things happening Put, putting it in that context I can see Robert Mitchum and his kind of his crazy howls when he's uh, when he's screaming after them in the river as that he watches them float away or when Ms. Rachel shoots at him and and he goes howling and yipping off to the barn. There's a couple of moments, or even just his kind of crazy Frankenstein walk up the stairs toward them. Yeah. Um, all of those moments are, it's it's almost like this heightened emotional uh, level of this monster in a kid's movie. And I think because of that, I really, I, I really liked it this time. And I really connected with that, uh, that place where Charles Lawton was wanting... Uh, Mitchum to go because there are plenty of other times where he is just really terrifying. I mean, when he's sitting and they're having that dinner table conversation and the kids are wanting to eat and he's just like, you can eat after you tell me where the money is. And he's showing the little five-year-old his switchblade and just like, and I can't remember what he starts saying to her, you poor, horrible little wretch of a thing or whatever. I mean, it's really terrifying Mm -hmm. that this is this monster talking to these young children this way. He, it, it is, and I, and I think his, um, you know, his uh, uh, rage-a-meter 
uh, <laughs> is a very low ceiling, uh, you know, and, and you're right. He goes from zero to insane very, very quickly. What I love so much about his performance, and, and you know, particularly for Robert Mitchum, is such a crazy, uh, um, it, it's a crazy performance for him, is that this character of Harry Powell is, is a textbook sociopath. I mean, mm-hmm. he's nuts. And yeah. he is justifying and rationalizing his own lack of, of moral center or, or sort of social uh, conscience, right, uh, w- with these conversations to God w- about how he's, you know, how God has led him to these places where he's been able, enabled to kill these women. And, and he is a, you know, uh, to see this character in the, you know, in the vestments of a priest— uh, coming to kind of unleash this sociopathic wrath on these little kids, I think is really interesting. But at his heart, he's a buffoon. He's a he's a goof. He he has, uh, you know, he's you can see when he's pushed into a corner that he's missing that sort of frontal lobe piece that that mm-hmm. um, that allows him to to respond uh, appropriately. But he hits that rage point and loses control. And and in some cases, it causes him to to howl in anger like he does when he's stuck in the bog as the kid. Mm-hmm. Are, are going down the river and in some cases like you point out he howls like an animal because he's he he doesn't there is no other uh way for him to respond like he he has no other mapping in his in his yeah. conscience and i think that's really interesting it's a it's a layer of complexity that i did not expect uh in this film uh it it really surprised me and i it it's the thing that i think makes it uh imminently rewatchable yeah, and and Robert Mitchum uh, apparently, you know, hearing uh, or some stories that people had talked about with Mitchum, you know, he was a kind of a Hollywood bad boy. I mean, he had, you know, he had been arrested for marijuana possession. He had, you know, worked on films high, and uh, this was a film where they said, you know, he did not. He was completely clean when he was making this film. Uh, I mean, this is their words. I don't. I don't know. But they said he was. He was completely clean when he made this film because he had such reverence for this script. He really felt that this script was was just a different level of work for him, and he really wanted to make sure that he was putting his all into it and doing it right and doing it justice. And apparently when he saw the finished film, he started crying. And, and I don't know if it's Charles Lawton or somebody asked him, he's like, what's wrong? And he said, you know, I just didn't know that I could be so good. And I think that speaks to, I mean, <laughs> probably during one of his crazy howls yeah, or something. Right. <laughs> Man, I crushed that howl. <laughs> I, I am <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Look at me playing Look at me. bad. <laughs> but, but, I mean, it, but there is this level of... Uh, of something going on with him in this film that is you're like you're right it's imminently rewatchable there's always going to be uh pleasure in in turning this on and seeing Mitchum whether it's the wrestle between the right hand left hand love and hate oh uh, whether, that's that is insane yeah that, it's, it's crazy yeah it's it just like that and like even when he's talking to uh John about and they actually like come clean and he's just like yeah the you know he admits he wants the money and this whole little conversation they have uh because john sees right through him and there's this glint in his eye when john makes the mistake of of saying i'll never tell you i won't tell i won't and basically admitting that he knows what he's after and he knows where this money is and just like the glint in his eye as he continues talking to uh to john it's just i mean there really is a lot of interesting stuff going on with mitchum in this film it, it, that is uh, absolutely the truth. I want to. Can you talk a little bit more about the love hate uh, sequence? Can you describe that? Uh, his his little story. Well, I, I just think it's a. I think it's become a famous a film moment where uh, maybe not even moment, just but it's just very famous that this like it's a symbol, is an icon. It's sort of in the, yeah, in the film iconography. Right, of this man, this preacher, with love written across uh, one hand and hate written across the other. And he tells this story about love and hate and this, in this biblical context about the old brother's love and hate and how hate would go after love and he was getting him down, he's getting it down. To, oh, but love comes back up and love <laughs> say love wins. And just the way that he does this with this like little hand wrestle in this uh, in he the does. spoons shop. 
it, it's just it's it's crazy and, and it totally mesmerizes everyone there and then it, it totally mesmerizes the audience because it's just this crazy little thing that he's doing it does and the way you do it just that is is almost exactly how he does it in the thing it's just like talking to himself and finger wrestling his own hands yeah it, right. it's it's just it's that and it has become this sort of uh, legend i think in in this sort of classic film and there and, and a lot of people have i think uh, i've seen a lot of pictures of you know other people who have tattooed love and hate across their their fingers. I'm not sure if this is the one that started it, but it sure seems, uh, you know, early enough. See, yeah, right. Yeah, it sure does. Uh, okay. Um, you have other stuff on Mitchum and Powell? You know, I don't think so. Um, you know, other than um, Mitchum, you know, like I said, he was kind of a notorious uh, character in Hollywood. And from from what I read, he got along with pretty much everybody on the set. He actually even really kind of worked closely with the kids in that scene I mentioned, the dining room scene, uh, kind of even doing some of his own directing with them, uh, you know, under Lawton's supervision, of course, but just kind of helping them understand what he was doing, like with the knife and stuff and working with them. My understanding is he got along great with everybody except for the producer, Paul Gregory, and uh, my understanding is, is there there was some real bad blood apparently between the two of them, and to the point where Mitchum went off and like peed on Gregory's car at one <laughs> point because he was so so pissed at him for something. Not to uh, coin a phrase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, that was yeah. good. Yep. Really nice. funny. Yep. So, uh, like, can we talk about Shelley Winters? Yeah, Shelley Winters. This is a tricky role for uh, anyone to play, I think. This level of, <laughs> or this place that this character has to be in uh, to succumb to somebody like the Preacher, I find really fascinating to watch. Yes. Uh, but I, I think that, for me, what was so stunning about her turn is that she ends up playing a a character that is uh, at once believable and yet has to play this transformation really quickly over the in in the film right i mean she's from the point that that she is introduced and you know after the initial uh, arrest of her husband um, to the point where she is you know at the bottom of the lake mm-hmm. it happens pretty quickly. Uh, and she is yeah. she is lost, found, born again, and done away with uh, over the course of about a half hour of yeah. screen time. And she, I think, she does a great job. Uh, to you know, I was thinking about it, uh, comparing it to um, uh, oh, please, Carrie's mom. Mm, yeah, yeah. Y- y- Hyper know, Laurie. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it was it was sort of one of those like uh, crazy. Um, uh, performances that I think she just nailed. Uh, I felt like I I really bought her as the the sweet doting wife. Uh, gone. I feel deep clean end. now. My yeah. whole body's just quivering with cleanness. With cleanness. <laughs> yeah, that was a very powerful <laughs> sequence. It's it, the thing. There are two sequences that I think really define her role in this film for me. The first one is. The scene when she comes to bed, it's their honeymoon. It's their wedding night. They just drove up to town to get married and, and came back, and it's it's nighttime. She comes to bed to uh, to hop into bed with him. He raises his hand as if he's going to take her, but then he points to the window and says, oh, can you get the window? And then And then there's this whole conversation where he's just demeaning her for basically wanting to have the honeymoon, uh, you know, j- jump in the sack sort of thing, you know? <laughs> and... And he just, he totally demeans her and the whole thing. He makes her look at herself in the mirror. And it's just, it's, it's just, you watch this woman just get broken to the point where after he breaks her and he goes back to bed, she just lays there and she says this little prayer to herself, uh, help me to be clean so I can be what Harry wants me to be. And I, I, it breaks my heart watching that scene because to see anyone in that place where they they end up with a person who just who demeans them so much that they are now praying to say, "Let me just be what they want me to be." And, oh, it just it it 
just terrifies me, but especially because she has these kids. And what is she doing as a mother? Right. She's and, just not doing a good job. And it's, uh, it's well, just... and, and that's the transformation because early in the film, we just seen her say, I can do this alone. And she was, she was, you know, really, uh, you know, kind of just standoffish and said, I don't, I, I can, I don't need a man. And it speaks to the horror of the preacher that this is this is how he doesn't just kill widows. He basically you know, charms them, charisma. He out charms them, them. Yeah, and then he he crushes them and destroys them and eventually kills them. I mean, it's just it's yeah. a terrible thing. And then the other moment is when he does kill her. Not not just for the way that it looks, because that is just one of the most beautifully beautifully haunting scenes. The way that Mitchum stands, everything about it, and the way she accepts her fate, again, as a as a as a parent, it's just it breaks my heart that she's at this place where she's willingly going into this situation, letting herself get killed, even though she has these two kids, and it's just it's horrifying that she does this. But that's the place that she's in, and she accepts it, and he kills her. Yeah, that's another one of those uh, diorama-like pullback sequences, right yeah. before that that uh, the, the murder, and it's uh, it's another really stunning sequence. Yeah, uh, and then he does off with her and puts her in the drink. And uh, that's that's one of those just images that I think sits with you. Her in the bottom of the river. Her hair. Yeah. Uh, the way it is uh, flowing with the the kind of weeds uh, underwater as you see her, and and it is a long sequence as the uh, you know as the uh, as Uncle Birdie, Birdie's Uncle fishing Birdie is fishing yeah. and can't can't quite catch the tr- the jeep, and eventually he does catch the jeep and discovers uh, her sitting on the bottom, yeah. uh, anchored to the jeep. Uh, it is a it's it's a pretty disgusting discovery. Yeah. And they didn't go light on it either. Lawton made sure that that slit across her throat was visible. I mean, it's not like in your face visible, but you can see a kind of a gash across her throat. And, you know, he just didn't go easy on on the audience with that. And it's it's pretty terrifying to see. It is um, terrifying and subtle. And there's a lot of the terror in this film that I think is is really subtle. It's not grotesque. You think that, there, and maybe it's because I'm conditioned to expect so much more kind of brutality. But it really is a cerebral sort of brutality. It's a it is very much a psychological thriller, and it's in a, in a very pure sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, who else is is on your list? Well, I think we absolutely have to talk about Lily and Gish. Yeah. Who I mean, geez, talk about somebody who's who's been around you know she she died uh, in 1993 i think a few months before her 100th birthday and uh, i mean she basically was there at the beginning of film she was in four or five of dw griffith's films and uh she continued acting all the way through uh 1987 in the whales of august and i think uh she either won an Oscar or was nominated for that. And uh, 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 so she's been around for a very long time and is a great actress. Um, Charles Lawton really wanted this film to kind of harken back to the silent days of cinema and the techniques that silent filmmakers used, so much so that he actually screened as many D.W. Griffith films as he could before he started production he wanted to just really have that vibe and look at the techniques that they were using and you can see some of them like the iris that great iris that they do um, as the preachers after he's killed uh, the mom as he's walking up to the house and you got the iris down onto the window revealing to the audience where the children are great silent film technique and also just a lot of the look you got a lot of that expressionist look and everything but Lillian was somebody that he kind of thought he'd love to have in this film. Wasn't sure he'd get her because I think she had kind of gotten sick of, of filmmaking for a little while and was doing some TV and, and uh, theater. And uh, somehow they got in touch with her and she really enjoyed the script and wanted to be in it. She brings this level of humanity. And, and speaking of the love and hate hands, um, she really is kind of the love in this film and she represents the good in the world. Whereas Powell represents the evil in the world. And 
from her speech at the beginning, talking about the the uh, the quotes from the Bible and the fruit, you know, you, you the good fruit from the good tree, the bad fruit from the bad tree. You clearly have her being the good fruit from the good tree and him being the bad fruit from the bad tree. Yeah, she is uh, symbolically, you know, really the the guardian angel of the of the piece, and you can see that it's not just her taking in these kids; it's her taking in all the kids uh, that yeah. that show up. These kids who don't know where their parents are, or who they do know where their parents are, but their can't, parents can't afford to take care of them. Like you get these little sort of cultural, sort of text uh, textural elements uh, where we, we we see just the impact that she makes. On the community, and that was one of those things I thought was uh, was a really powerful um, sort of storytelling technique, right? To give us a sense of where she is in this universe, to to illustrate her walking to and from the grocery store, right, to the the market, mm-hmm. uh, and have these little stops along the way where the the mom comes out, the waitress comes out and talks to her, and is, is make sure you come to dinner, and and uh, we see the the older girl uh, Ruby. Uh, you know, uh, talking to some older boys, and we see mm-hmm. her kind of coming of age herself, and we see, right. uh, you know, we see all of these elements to give a sense of the kind of guardian angel that uh, that Lillian Gish's character, uh, uh, Miss uh, Rachel Cooper, is, and it ends up being a a very quick and efficient way to get us uh, bought into her role because she comes into play very late in the film. Yeah. Even though she's introduced right at the beginning, interestingly, in a very angelic sort of way, yes. that guardian angel, her in the sky, kind of over the over the uh, stars as she's telling these stories right. to these little floating kid faces. Right, right. And then we don't. We, I, I, I'm glad you said that because we do see her very first, uh, but only for a couple of lines, right? And then then she's gone for, you know, until the kids head up river or down river. Yeah, right. Until they until they end up. Yeah. At her shore. So I, I thought that was a, a really useful kind of way to, to get her in. And and then you're bought in. And then you, you just sort of believe in her role and you, you have this sense of trust, even though that trust is tested, I think, a couple of times, uh, or, or at least in one sequence uh, when the, the reverend just shows up, you can see just how um, a devout a protector she ends up being as she uh, uh, she kind of leads an inquisition against Harry Powell and... and uh, uh, discovers that uh, uh, that he is in fact not not the daddy, not the preacher, and uh, takes over. And it's great how she does that. Where unlike the other adults in the film, like uh, Mrs. Spoon or Mister and Mrs. Spoon, really, um, and and even you know the the kid's mom, she believes the kids. All these other people buy into the preacher and and every all these lies that he keeps spinning. Uh, especially Mrs. Spoon, she totally buys into it. And <laughs> I love her name, Icy I Spoon. Icy Spoon, isn't that great? <laughs> and, uh, uh, the moment that I that always strikes me, it just like it's such a, a frustrating moment in the film, because the kids are hiding in the basement, and uh, he, you know, he the preachers figured out they're in the basement, but they won't come out. She comes over, and it's like this moment where kids, as as much as they know they're running they're at a point where they basically have to run for their lives because this other adult authority figure comes in and it's just like stop this nonsense come up here right now they do it you that's, know, it's su- like, that surprised me that was the one point where i thought that's not going to be believable to me because my instinct is to say those kids are going to use this as an opportunity to get away and yet somehow at the end of that sequence because of her sense of authority on screen i bought it exactly and that's the thing it's just like when that when, there are those certain authority figures for kids that even though your life depends on it if they tell you to come and you shouldn't you're going to come because they told you to and and you know what i i think it's uh, in the back of my mind I, I thought you know what if i was john in this case i'd be thinking wow the preacher's in trouble too you know mm-hmm. <laughs> Like yeah. you get in a fight on the playground, everybody gets busted, right. uh, and that's that's sort of the sense that I had. No matter how sort of powerful a sociopath uh, Harry Powell is on screen, he still was in in some way, shape, or form under the thumb of Miss Rachel Cooper, the guardian angel. It was yeah. very, it's very powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of fun absolutely. way to play that. And she right. co- totally reads him right from the start, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, it's great, and and that's a great moment with John and her when when John is like, "He ain't my dad," and she looks at him and she totally knows it. She's mm-hmm. she's right there with him. So yeah, 
Yep. Yep. Great stuff. What else? Um, Peter Graves. Brief it's, but awesome. Exactly. Brief but awesome. It's <laughs> it's always fun to see Peter Graves in whatever it is that he's up to. What was the deal with the conversation that he has in prison? So they're <laughs> in the jail, and and he is uh, so he's like what I gather pretending to be asleep. At, at this point, but it, 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 you get the sense that uh, he has been talking in his sleep and that the preacher, who is his cellmate, uh, has been trying to coax the location of the money out of him in his sleep. Uh, mm-hmm. But Peter Graves, is, uh, as Ben Harper, is somehow aware that this is going on. And so the preacher is, is, is this fantastic sequence where the preacher is like hanging down like a child off the top bunk, <laughs> right. upside down, and Peter Graves hauls off and decks him in the face knocks him off the off the bunk bed right. it's just perfect <laughs> and then they proceed to have this conversation where he says over and over you keep talking preacher you keep mm-hmm. talking preacher and then as, stuffs something in his mouth <laughs> as he stuffs something in his mouth so he won't talk in his sleep anymore <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's That's, a great little moment it yeah. was great it was great uh i i love that sequence and then we don't hear much from from old ben harper after that yeah he gets hung yeah, and, and uh, yeah, it's it's a great you know just there's something about Peter Graves that I think just his presence I think lends enough to the to the screen for the short time that he's in it just to you can really sense this connection between him and the kids especially John when he comes running home after he stole this ten thousand dollars and uh, I I don't know I just I I really think that Lawton cast well for that role. Can I, I let me think. ask you though, and, and this is maybe it's because the beginning of the film happened too fast and I missed something. Um, but he comes, he, he runs back uh, and says, I got to hide this money. Uh, mm. Swear to me, you won't tell where it is. And he's got blood on his shirt, right? Right. Yes. And so he's arrested and taken away and he is hung because of, because uh, he had killed, he'd two, killed men. two men. In his attempt, in his in his robbery, right. how how important do you think it is? Uh, how important is how we feel about him and his and the justice that occurred there uh, in our viewing of the film? You know, I mean, that's that's something that I was really paying attention to this time because these kids are. I mean, it's it's you know post depression. Everyone is in uh, a bad place, or most people. And it was very interesting to me that as I was thinking about this, I'm like, God, you know, this this kid is, you know, essentially keeping his bank robber murderer father's money safe when he'd be better off just giving it back. But he's just listening to his father. And um, it's just one of those situations where the father wasn't a good person. I mean, he was clearly a criminal. He paid for his crimes by getting hung by the neck until he was dead. And and I think that there's some of that emotion maybe in the kid when he, you know, kind of explodes at the end and, and, and just can't handle dealing with this issue with the money anymore. But I, But to me, it seems less about, you know, the son doing that because he morally, he knows that it's wrong what his father did. And, you know, Morris just he just can't deal with this this trauma that he's been going through because he's protecting the money. Um, You know, I don't know. I I think that it's a very interesting place when you put it in context of the depression and how how the world was working back then. And he wants his family to have a better life, but they're really not going to if they're living off of the stolen money. And in the end, it's probably better that John ended up getting rid of the money so that he was able to move on to a better place in his own head. Yeah, uh, and that was uh, that. I'm I'm torn on that one, and I, I I think we're on the same page on it. I I to me there there are two sort of justices here. The first one is the the practical legal justice that you know he killed two men while robbing a bank, and practically and legally. That you know that was the law of land at the time and mm-hmm. in in the universe of the film, and so I I buy that, but it seems to me that uh, you know Lawton and um, James Aggie, uh, you know certainly Davis Davis Grubb, though I also haven't read the novel, are making a point in that sequence in the prison um, when you have Peter Graves making his case. 
uh, a, a sober sort of uh, approach to why he did it because he mm-hmm. was sick of uh, and tired of watching kids on the street, yeah. uh, you know, who can't eat. Um, and, and, and that we- to me, like, it, it seemed like they made such an obvious case through Peter Graves at this sense of higher justice that he did what was right for his family at the time because of the context and, and, and the, what he was dealing with in his, uh, on his farm that, uh, that, that that should be important yeah. for us. And and the fact that, that they freed themselves from the money that was, you know, blood money at the end, as you say, and, and he ended up, and that John ended up, and Pearl ended up being protected in the in the end anyway, I think is a is a testament to um, that second justice. Yeah. It is interesting, though. I, I, I really felt this film tied itself well with the period... In, in just in little ways that I didn't, uh, I, maybe I just hadn't caught before, but just so much of the dialogue, the slang that people use, I mean, it's just all through it. It's just really bad grammar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, and it's like, God, this really does feel like 1930s river folk kind of just talking. And this yeah. is kind of the the way that people lived. And in some way, I think that they're, I mean, I, I think that they would acknowledge that robbing the bank is, is probably a bad thing. But on the other hand, it's like times were so tough back then. Uh, maybe killing the people was bad thing, but getting the money from the bank and just trying to create a better life for your kids. I think a lot of people back then would probably say, you know, I can totally see where he's coming from. Exactly. And, yeah. 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 It's, it's, a, it's a tricky... Uh, it's a tricky little bit of a uh, uh, a psychology game playing there, you know. You said at the beginning that this film did not perform very well. This film, uh, I there's no numbers on it. Uh, I found that it cost about eight hundred thousand to make, um, which you know, if if people are interested in our little movie breakdown, I actually have gone through and I've adjusted it all for inflation. So. <laughs> Eight, eight, I love eight, that so much. I, oh yes, me and all the geeky things I do. Uh, uh, eight hundred thousand dollars in 1955 dollars is a budget of about six point eight million. So you know it's a decent uh, kind of low budget film uh, kind of budget. They uh, that's all I found though. I couldn't find anything on how much it actually made. All I know is that from everything I've read, uh, the studio that released this. Oddly, I, I think it was United Artists and uh, or MGM. I want to say it was the same people who did the killing and did a really bad job releasing it. I could be wrong on on the studio, but they they paired it with a, another film when they released it, kind of a double feature on the back end of it, and it just it didn't have what it needed to draw people in, and people just didn't click with it. It did horribly. And uh, it's it's just really too bad. It, it, it took a long time. It was I think it was TV when it started playing on TV that people started finding it and realizing there was more to it. Well, it's uh, a relief that they did. Yeah. Uh, because this is, this film is it's really it's worth taking a closer look at. This is one of those that I think you, you don't want to get lost in the in the void. It's uh it's worth watching. Yeah. It's it's scary. It's a good couples on the run film from the you know from a, a new angle, a new direction. I'm glad we I'm sh- surely glad we did it in this series. Yeah. It's a shame that it did so poorly that Charles Lawton was never given the chance to direct again. And he he really took it personally that it uh, it did poorly. People didn't like it, and he ended up dying. I think about uh, seven years after it. I'm not saying that it's what killed him, but <laughs> it was a seven year, <laughs> yeah, seven long, year slow seven death. years slow <laughs> demise. But it did it did really take a toll on him. He really um, was uh, wanting it to be something special, and I think he'd be happy now. That people have have latched onto it, but at the time, I think it really it really got to him. So, mm. should we? Um, uh, you, well, you have others. I have a few Give me your last, last things. Few notes, um, and I'll be real quick. Stanley Cortez, beautiful cinematography all the way through this. He um, he did the Magnificent Ambersons with Orson Welles, and um, aside from a bunch of other wonderful fil- films, and Cortez said that um, he there's this great quote, something about how light and shadow are these undefinable things that very few people understand. And he said, 
of all the directors he had ever worked with, only Orson Welles and Charles Lawton really understood the way to work with light and shadow. So that's a nice little, a nice little testament to uh, Charles Lawton and his direction in this film. Oh, yes. And Walter Schumann and his wonderful music in this film. I really, really enjoy the score. I enjoy the themes all the way through this. And the... Uh, the songs that pop up throughout these kind of lullabies and hymns that really fit. Um, he's most notable, I think nowadays, or maybe, maybe not, but, uh, he's most notable for the music that he did in Dragnet. Yes. He wrote the theme for Dragnet. And from that is, uh, his theme plays in everything all the time. Still. I, uh, you know, I wasn't paying enough, attention on this viewing to the to the score so it's not particularly rem- memorable for me right now but the the songs that the children sing yeah. the little tunes that are sung around town are so haunting that those you you are you really can't forget the, yeah, i think but, there's just a sense that that music and him is is a character in this film and i i, I imagine a lot of that credit goes to uh schumann yeah absolutely yeah uh, so much so that lawton uh, several times over the course of the production, felt that he needed to have the composer on set while they were working to help kind of get a, a sense of the vibe of what was happening and to help them shoot it. So it's a pretty interesting little uh, relationship that Lawton ended up developing with some of his crew members. That's very cool. That yeah. is very cool. Um, Harry, uh, the, the character of the preacher, Harry Powell, is actually based on a real serial killer. Well, that's charming. Yeah, Harry Powers was uh, a uh, a convicted serial killer, and back in 1932, he was hanged. He was um, putting out ads, these Lonely Hearts ads, finding widows and actually killing them, and it, just horrific stuff that ended up happening. But uh, he was known as the Bluebeard of Quiet Dell, which I think is interesting that at the end of this film, all the the people in the in the crowd at the court are screaming Bluebeard, Bluebeard. So. <laughs> I'm not gonna oh. lie to you. You sounded like Kermit the Frog yelling "Bluebeard" just uh, just for <laughs> a second. I? Yeah, a little bit. Hi-de-ho. Hi-de-ho. <laughs> <laughs> Bluebeard. Bluebeard. Oh, um, yes. That and, is uh, actually fascinatingly dark. I did. I didn't. Uh, I didn't catch that. I've never known that until yeah. uh, this my latest bout of research on this. And then the last little bit, and we should post uh, links to these. But there are three books about the production of this film that are out there. Uh, Heaven and Hell to Play With, the filming of The Night of the Hunter by Preston Neal Jones. The Night of the Hunter in the BFI Film Classics series, uh, written by Simon Callow, who's not only uh, an author but an actor. And uh, The Night of the Hunter, a biography of a film by Jeffrey Couchman. So there's a lot of people who've done a lot of studying of this film. And the Criterion uh, Blu-ray edition of this actually has this film that they have put together, I think, in about 2003, called Charles Lawton Directs the Night of the Hunter. Lawton, when he was filming this, wasn't cutting. He just let his film go, and he would talk to the actors and say, okay, let's do it again. And so there was tons of footage. Well, all this footage ended up in, I think, the USC or the UCLA archives. That's where it was. And this guy uh, ended up compiling all of this this footage and basically making it an incredible behind the scenes documentary of a film getting made basically you watch through the whole process of the film from the beginning to the end and you hear Lawton directing you hear the actors working with their lines playing their scenes and he gives a lot of backstory it's a it's an absolutely great documentary it's almost three hours long it's really long but it's really engrossing so Oh, that's great lots, right. lots well, of things I recommend checking out make sure we have that uh, link in the notes definitely definitely and now i think we uh, i think we need to get to flick charting i think we do excellent you can find us at flickchart.com slash the next reel and while you're there well you can friend us you know if you'd like that's always that's always fine i not many people do but you can also find our uh, our flick chart just go into the next and um and you'll see the the golden the road to to our next real top 100. We're not quite there. We're very very close. I thought we were there. Uh, well, we well, actually I guess technically we're there. We hit it last week with the Wolverine, yeah. but but um uh which, of which the includes actual, of the it, actual films we've done. Right, we, we've done right. 100. If you take out the film board films were, were So this week technically 
we will be at 101. This will right. take us to 101, and I'm going to anticipate. I'm going to go ahead and call it. I think Rush, 1991, Rush by Lily Finney Zenick is going to fall off our top 100 tonight. I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it is. I, I almost, I, I 100% guarantee. All right, are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> the Night of the Hunter or Moon? Oh man. I'm totally Knight of the Hunter. I I'm gonna be hard pressed to wow. uh, yeah to pick Moon over that. Moon. The, the oh. Knight of the Hunter is just a visual feast. Ah, oh, okay, okay, <laughs> but it was hard. I this can is, tell. I can I'm get a hard time with that one. Yeah. Oh well, now we get this one will be hard for me. The Knight of the Hunter. Or the social network. Oh, social network. Uh, I'm so uh, I I feel guilty picking the social network. I would you feel I honestly, guilty. I do. I honestly would would watch the Night of the Hunter. Uh, I think I would watch it. Gosh, would I watch it more than the Social Network? Let me I just say know. that I'm going to put it to you this way: If you were to get everyone remaining who works on the social network together. And everyone remaining who worked on Night of the Hunter together in a room like Dodgeball, I think if you were going to feel guilty, I would feel guilty more about the social network because that's going to be a bigger crowd. You're hurting more feelings. <laughs> Are you saying just because Robert Mitchum is dead that it's okay? Well, to I didn't want to it? say it like that. That's cold, <laughs> man. When you say it, it sounds really horrible. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Ah, gosh, I, you know, I'll I'll pick Social Network, but I'm not going to like it. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, now you know how it feels. The Night of the Hunter or The Town. I'm totally going to Night of the Hunter on this one. Yeah, I'll go Night of the Hunter on that one. Sure. Okay. Easy. Uh, the Night of the Hunter or The Natural. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Night of the Hunter on this one. I, uh, I You know, I, honestly, I could go either way. It surprises me that you're Night of the Hunter on this one. Really? Yeah, it does. I thought you were going right. to go all man tears. I'll, I'll go Night of the Hunter on this I, one. Too. The natural isn't the man tears one for me. Oh, well, maybe they. All right. That's all right. Field of Dreams. That's Field the of natural, Dreams. Oh, the that's natural right. is my crazy ghost film. Uh, <laughs> I'll never get that out of my head. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm fine with Night of the Hunter on this. All right. The Night of the Hunter or Zero Dark Thirty? I have to go Night of the Hunter. I, I find it much more watchable. Zero Dark Thirty, I think, is a great film, but it's a hard film to watch. Okay. I don't want to be all complacent on all of these, but I know, I'm going to I'm going to get this one. I'll I'll do this one too. I'm fine with that. The Night of the Hunter or True Romance. I'm still going Night of Hunter. <laughs> Man, with the way you play it, it could have uh, have gone all the way to the top. Yeah. I it could have. I I mean, uh, uh I'll go Night of the Hunter too. So so that puts it ahead of True Romance, but behind The Social Network? Yeah, which is exactly where it's ended up, number 27. Okay. All right. That's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. Well done. What are we doing next week? Do we even know? It's been such... We've been juggling. We, we've been juggling. I, I think we should go with our original plan, though. Wait, what? Which one was that? <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll have to talk about it off the air. So we're not going to tell people what we're doing now. Well, not if we don't know what we're doing. Because <laughs> <laughs> this will be our last night of the hunter, right? Or I mean, our last couples last on the couples run is what you're telling run. me. It is the last couples on the run, and then we start a whole new series. Oh, I don't even want to talk about it yet. I'm too excited. It's another series that uh, that somebody uh, somebody has asked for. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we'll give him a shout out next week. That's right. Okay, uh, so, uh, right. Um, I don't think there's any reason for people to be listening anymore. Do we have any other announcements? Nope. Yeah, people should have already turned it off by now. Yes. There's nothing useful that comes after this. Nothing at all. We've covered all of the important stuff and even some meaningless stuff. And now yep. we're just blabbering. Blabber, blabber. Tonight's winning lottery numbers will be... 
It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. And some stinkers. Well, true. But you know, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchase is made through our links. Give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. In season three, we covered even more great adaptations like The Night of the Hunter and It Happened One Night, both part of our Couples on the Run series. We talked about No Country for Old Men. The Coen brothers so rarely adapt someone else's work. We had some fun rom-com adaptations like About a Boy, based on the Nick Hornby novel, and Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, adapted from Rachel Cohn and David Levithan's book. In our terribly and naively named foreign language series, we discussed the brilliant City of God and the Diving Bell and the Butterfly, which I won't ever be able to watch again, ever. But could you read the original memoir? I don't know, maybe? We had our Richard Dysart series with adaptations like The Day of the Locust and Being There. Plus, we had that fantastic interview with the man himself. (laughs) The one where we had him sit on the floor? Because this chair was so squeaky. (laughs) Good times. We did our first Tom Hanks series with Forrest Gump adapted from Winston Groom's novel, plus Apollo 13 based on Lost Moon by Jim Lovell. And we did another year series looking at films from 1981, including Das Boot, Gallipoli, and Thief, all based on books. Listeners can dive deeper into all of these original stories and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book, play, movie, video game. Video game. (laughs) You bet. We have talked about some video game adaptations as well. It doesn't matter the source, just follow the link. Every purchase supports the podcast. Check out the full list at thenextreel.com slash originals and get reading, watching, performing, or playing today.